So thank you so much for this opportunity to talk to you guys about my research. Um, as you can see, it's titled Virtually Adapting to a New Reality. And we know that right now, I'm not going to go over all the challenges we're facing, but it's 2020. And there are two things that I do want to talk about. That is, one is the, that what, what's 20, what 2020 has really, you know, brought out of the woodwork and something that's always been here, but just is really bringing it to the forefront is, you know, systemic racism. Additionally, with, you know, with the elections going on, or the elections having had happened, but also, you know, for a matter of time, you know, we've been dealing with a lot of misinformation, you know, especially when we have a lot of these social networks. Um, but in addition to combating so systemic racism and misinformation, we're also having to deal with distant learning, especially for parents, students, and teachers. And as we're looking at this situation, especially just, you know, looking at these two to three things, kind of wonder like what can we do as do as anthropologists and cultural preservationists like what can i contribute to helping with this and so i think about like the mission statements that a lot of anthropology groups have um done there we go you know providing an understanding of our shared humanity to foster an appreciation, to expand understanding and appreciation, to advance scholarly understanding of humankind in all its aspects, and to make that knowledge available to a broader public. And I just, I look at these statements and I'm like, yeah, that's, that's what I feel. That's what I want to do. But the efforts of anthropological, I shouldn't say, but, but it's, the efforts of anthropological research and being able to help people learn about other cultures and identities is a step in breaking down barriers of prejudice. But we typically just do it through research papers. I mean, we have these, I mean, there are the social networks in the sense of, you know, the Facebook pages, we have meetings like this, and these are great. I'm, I'm not putting these down at all. But at the end, when we want someone to be like, okay, yeah, learn about this society, or learn about this culture, we refer them to like Google Scholar. So is this enough? And it's, it's working. I'm not going to say it's broken, but I will say we can do more. And to talk about that, I want to talk about stories. And this is why. Because... In stories, we are engaged because we are carried along with the protagonists from the beginning to the end. We learn the lessons from their failures and how those lessons help them succeed in the end. We feel their despair and their hope. Whether the main character is good or bad, we find ourselves relating to them. What if this were me? In Schindler's List, we cry with Schindler because he wanted to save more people. In There Will Be Blood, we feel the pain of Daniel when he acknowledges that he abandoned his family. But there is excitement when in Endgame, we cheered when the Calvary showed up to fight Thanos. We felt the hero's hope. So then why did we get angry with season eight of Game of Thrones? Because I think we weren't learning, we weren't seeing any lessons that the characters were supposedly learning. We weren't understanding their failures and successes. We can't relate. There's no contrast for clarity. It's our relationship to the characters as they go through their challenges that gives us clarity, which helps us evaluate our own circumstances and challenges. In turn, it can give us discernment or empathy and compassion towards others because the stories are helping us learn from our own failures. So as Bob Ross would say, we don't make mistakes, we just have happy accidents. And he's not wrong because whether they be mistakes or failures, we can choose to learn from them and turn them into happy accidents. But how does this tie into cultural preservation and anthropology? 
As Harper Lee said with Atticus Finch, you really ne you never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view. Well, we teach our students that the best way to learn about a culture is to go and live with them, interview them, have an outsider and insider approach so that you attempt a full grasp of their society. We try to do the best we can in relating our research and experiences to the public, but it's just not the same. With current technology combined with storytelling, even cinematic storytelling theory, it means we can go further with what we're doing as anthropologists and cultural preservationists. So for example, let me show you this. I was 16 years old and my father allowed me to go. I was just turned 17 at the time. I was 16. And I was 15 years. When they came to us, they were frightened children and had to be made into soldiers. Well, boys, here it comes. We're in the pictures. <laughs> I gave every part of my youth to do a job. There was a job to be done, and you just go on and did it. So that was, uh, this is a documentary collaboration done by Peter Jackson, who did Lord of the Rings. And to make it relatable, he and his team, they restored, they upscaled the resolution, they brought in lip readers, they figured out the colors of each uniform and the uh, just the landscape and the weapons. Um, they brought in voice actors from different regions of England to read the scripts written by the lip readers because each regiment was from like a different part of England. And so they got actors from those parts so that it would be more, uh, more real. They, they got into these specifics and they restored hundreds, if not thousands of hours of film and photographs for the World War I uh, Museum in it's either England or New Zealand. But um, th it's just incredible. I mean, you, you watch this and it just comes to life and you can look at, you look at each of these people and we know that they each have their own stories just incredible stories, whether good or bad, they have individual stories and it comes together as, you know, the human whole, it's the human experience. But can this go further? So let's look at the next one. It's important to have our history, our past documented. 
How did you survive hiding in an attic from the Nazis? Life in hiding was full of fear, hunger, and cold. But through it all, I hoped and believed that I would live. My message is simple. Be an upstander. Be involved. Make a difference. So this is done in Chicago at the Holocaust, Holocaust Museum, um, where uh, they were they interviewed uh, Holocaust survivors, as you can see, were interviewed for this project and were filmed and photographed in a way to create holograms where they're projecting a 3D image onto like a mesh screen. And that gives it the illusion of it being a hologram like you'd see in Star Wars. Um, these survivors were asked over 2000 questions using the questions and answers and the variations that people would ask the questions. An AI algorithm was created so that you could ask practically any question you wanted and the holographic facsimile would respond accordingly. It's your own personal interview with the Holocaust survivor. But can we take this further? So Alejandra Inaritu directed this Oscar-winning VR experience. They scanned, tracked, and simulated the experience of, an Im of immigrants crossing into the US. They had ceiling fans to simulate ICE's helicopters. They had you remove your shoes and walk in dirt. And leading up to the experience, you would see shoes, photos, quotes of those who crossed the border. In the experience, when you approached people, they would become transparent and you could see their heart beating, all in an effort to help us have an emotional experience and to relate to people that we would consider as the other. So with Carne Irina, we are starting to see what we can do with VR in terms of helping people learn about people. VR has been termed as empathy machines. In this light, we can use VR to help cultivate empathy, compassion, and a love of humanity. By creating narratives using research and personal stories, we can create emotional experiences that bring people into a sense of awe and transcendent experiences of awe help, pe help give people a sense of connected humanity. In this regard, they will see others more like themselves and not as foreigners or as, as I said previously, the other. And in turn, this can help lead people to recognizing their own prejudices and discriminations. In other words, we can create a safe virtual environment that allows the viewer to reflect and make a choice about how they will interpret, theorize what they have observed and how they will apply their theory. Because testing that theory will create new concrete experiences. The hope is that the hope 
is they will see their compassion towards someone they had previously perceived as the other bear good fruit and that the empathy they felt in VR can occur in real life. So how can we achieve this with education and VR? Come on. There we go. Santos and all in 2013 published a paper where they conducted a meta study and found that virtual reality and augmented reality can be powerful learning tools with the approach of three modes of learning theory. The first is multimedia learning. This is where you have annotations over an image. They found that when you have those annotations on your images that people, it's easier for people to recall, you know, just it gets set more into their long term. Next is experiential learning. I talked about this, but this is where people can be in their, the context of what they're learning about, where they can draw on their concrete experiences, make reflective observations, develop theories based on those observations, test those theories, and then after testing them, create new concrete experiences. And then animate vision learning. This is the vision haptic response. This is where it's interactive, where you can pick things up, see cause and effect, just based on how you are interacting with the objects. And in VR, that's actually possible. There's a place here in Vegas and in different parts of the West Coast. They might have expanded more outward, but it's a place called The Void. The Void is a VR venue where the participant wears a vest and a headset, and they pretty much enter a labyrinth. The rooms have body tracking sensors, and what the participant is viewing in their headset is mapped onto the physical environment. And what I mean by that is that if you see a door handle in the VR world, you reach out to grab it, you'll actually feel a and grab feel and grab a door handle in the real world. Same thing with walls, switches, even stairs in the digital world are also felt and experienced in the real world. It's pretty surreal when you do it with someone else and give each other a fist bump after successfully fighting off the evil Star Wars Empire. But all of this together, it's an effort of sharing stories in a proper manner that helps the viewer relate to it while learning about human diversity. This can be successful when working with the cultural groups, museums, and archaeologists to create an experience that is factual, respectful, and emotionally relatable. That means the aim is not to necessarily focus on the ritual side of a cultural group, but the challenges that individuals and groups are facing and have faced how they overcome those challenges, and how they cope. We connect with someone when we see them face a challenge that we can empathize, empathize with versus seeing them perform a ritual that isn't familiar. That way, when the viewer does learn about the ritual, they have a more respectful understanding of what the ceremony is about. So it's kind of trying to get rid of you know, the glass display in the sense of, helping people understand why a ceremony or an object or a place is sacred to someone else. And they can do that by having their own experience that helps them empathize with that worldview. So then I just, this comes around to how, how can we make this possible? How can we make this a reality? I mean, we saw with Carne Arena, that was actually a traveling exhibit at different museums throughout the U.S. and I think even in Europe. Um, but we, we've got a problem right now. It's 2020. We've got COVID. And the problem with that is we it right. I mean, right now, the governor came out with a statement saying, you know, he, he's asking us to self-quarantine for 14 days and. La City Museum actually just announced that, you know, or is either La City Museum or Springs Preserve or both just announced that, you know, they're closing their doors until um, 
for two weeks at least. But even then, when they were open during this time, it was limited access. And then even before COVID-19 was happening, you know, there were people that didn't realize that we had Lost City Museum. And the ones that did know, they're like, I just, you know, a lot of them were like, I just, I never have gotten, been able to get out there. So how can we get that to them? Well, one of the efforts I've been doing is uh, working with other grad students and undergrads and digitizing artifacts at Lost City Museum. And so far we've digitized about 47 artifacts. And once I'm done with the PowerPoint, I'll pull up the website and show you guys. It's just, it's kind of hard to transition between the PowerPoint and the, the website at co-currently. Um, but the point is that there can be an effort to get this stuff out to the public and we can do that through 3D modeling and through VR. Um, just recently, or just this last year, no, last, yeah, 2019, uh, my dear friend Spencer Holmes and I, we co-directed a documentary for Lost City Museum. When we were showing it to everyone, excuse me, when we were showing it to everyone, people were just astonished, like, this is a real place? This, this is in Nevada? Yeah, it is. And then COVID-19 happened. <laughs> but with that in mind, again, it comes to the question. This is fine. You know, you're probably thinking, Ben, this is great. It's cool what you're doing. You know, space age tech, right? How does this help people? How can we get this out to people? Well, 81% of Americans own a smartphone. 96% ages 18 to 29 own a smartphone. 92% ages 30 to 49. And 79% ages to 50 to 64. We can use smartphones as VR headsets using a piece of cardboard called Google Cardboard. And we're finding that the internet is becoming the main source for science information. So if we combine that, those two points of data and try to, you know, apply it, you know, was it middle range theory of the rubber hits the road? We can create VR experiences just on people's smartphones. And if they can't, don't have access to a smartphone, let alone a Google car or a Google cardboard, then they can still access it on a computer. I mean, it, get, it does get to a point of like, well, what if they don't have a computer? Well, I, <laughs> I'll leave that up to other people to try to figure that out. But for now, the people that do have access, which is a large percentage of Americans, we can get this to them without having them spend an additional $500 for a high-end VR headset. So fortunately, we can look at using smartphones as a VR headset. If that is not available, they can still access, as I said, their experiences on their computers. And we can look at funding to support these projects for museums that don't have large budgets. And we can work with schools to show how these things are available as resources for teachers, parents, and students. For example, this month, my wife has been using the three models from Lost City Museum to help teach her art class during this the National Native American Heritage Month right now. She has shown them 360 degrees of the Lescaux Cave on YouTube, and it is so fun to hear the sounds of awe in their amazement at what they're looking at. It's those sounds of awe which give me hope that while we are dealing with a lot of challenges, these technologies can help us bridge the gap that divides our nation and a, pande a pandemic that separates us from our classmates, coworkers, friends, family, and neighbors. It is through experiencing the stories found throughout human diversity that we can begin to relate and break down our prejudices. And in VR, using the theories of learning and storytelling, we can have emotional experiences through interactive problem solving and relating to the characters in the story. Thereby, with the help of this technology, we can bring these experiences into homes and help us adapt to a new reality. So I'm going to quickly stop sharing that. 
bring up the VR models. So right here, we have 47 models that working with a couple of undergrads, we were able to digitize for the museum. And in looking at them, once it loads, you can zoom in, get a real close look move them around. And then down here, we give information about the ceramics and just a little background on it. And then even links to additional ceramics of the same type. We even include some annotations. Just to ex help explain to people, you know, how these ceramics were made. Because one thing that's a huge hurdle is that with me, you know, putting artifacts on display and talking about artifacts, is that these aren't just objects, they are created by someone. There's a story behind this object. One of my favorites is Let's see where is it? is this one. The reason why I love this was found because... in the early 1900s. This unfinished yeah. corrugated bowl was a unique Sorry about that. Testing out doing a voiceover with my friend Matt. Um with this corrugated bowl or it's not corrugated. It is corrugated. I apologize. <laughs> this corrugated bowl when you're looking at it, you have the designs and to me this looks like someone was trying out designs. I mean you've got lines overlaying each other going beyond you know not just stopping so they pretty much just drew the outline before they colored it in that's a story right there you know why didn't they finish what was their purpose what were they trying to learn were they trying to learn a certain new technique were they just trying to make another bowl who are they making this for you know there's there's stories behind these things and it isn't just here's a bowl it's here's a bowl that someone made and that person has a story behind it. So in sharing all this, the point is that what we're working towards, or at least, you know, well, I shouldn't say at least, but what we're focused on as anthropologists and cultural preservationists is that we're trying to make sure that people can relate to the past, relate to other cultures, and in the end, be able to break down those barriers of prejudice. And I believe that through VR, we can do that because it puts you in context of those stories and experiences and just creates a more immersive emotional experience for the viewer that while they're still learning, they're also experiencing and being able to relate to, some, to the people that they are learning about. So that when they take off that headset, they'll suddenly realize, you know, if I can feel this way about someone in VR, why can't I feel this way about my neighbor? And the hope is, is that, you know, maybe spread a bit more peace and love throughout the community, especially during these trying times and being able to get these technologies accessible to people in schools by helping teachers incorporate it into their curriculum and making it accessible to everyone, regardless of their economic, you know, situation. So that's it. Thank you, Ben. That was a very interesting presentation. I didn't know there were that many people um, who have done these kind of immersive experiences and that they're you know spreading around um i know that there's one for dementia that they put people through which is a learning tool so people can understand what it's like to live with dementia um, but having it relate to somebody's experience you know crossing the border or 
or whatever it is that I think is, is super powerful. Um, and then tying that back into the museums was nice for us to see how how that kind of relates a little bit to a lot of the people that are on here today and what they do with um, learning about archaeology and about a, um, Samantha Rubinson, who runs the stewardship program. Um, we use some of your models that you've done um, for the Lost City to help people identify artifacts and stuff because we have to do remote trainings now. So it's a lot harder um, to explain to somebody, um, oh, you got to look at the thickness and the temper and the, but to put it in front of them um, in the way that you have it is super helpful. Mm. So um, I'm going to open it up for questions. I think I just clicked this button. All right. Does anybody have any questions? Anyone? Oh, if, if you guys are thinking of yeah, questions. I opened it wrong. <laughs> one thing, um, one thing I want to mention is that, you know, with this, the whole idea of, you know, VR and, oh, my background disappeared. I just noticed that. Um, with VR is the reason why I showed those experiences or what has happened, you know, or let me rephrase that. What other people are doing is uh, that they're mainly, there are people that are more on the cinematic side of things. They don't have anthropology anthropological training or archaeological training and they provide these amazing experiences i mean you got peter jackson you've got alejandro Inarritu. the holocaust museum is especially amazing because you know they're interviewing actual holocaust survivors but again that's just a one-on-one -on -one. they tell amazing stories but what if you could actually you know walk where they walked and you kind of you kind of risk I mean, I, I'm just throwing it out there. You do risk a violence porn with it, but at the same time, it helps us remember that these things actually happened. But if we can come in as anthropologists and archaeologists and just kind of fuse the two together, I think we can create these really, you know, immersive experiences that get to the emotional truth of events and get to the factual, the facts and the, uh, the traditions of these cultures in schools, instead of just like, oh, check out this really cool event of Carne Arena at the Smithsonian. Whereas no, it's like, no, we can do this in school now. So, all right, I see questions, sorry. So have I done scans of anything larger than the Lost City, Muse Lost City artifacts? Yes, I have. Um, the artifacts I've done are, or I've done larger artifacts. I've actually done archeological sites. Um, I did a couple of sites for uh, Dr. Roth in the Mogollon area. I've done archeological sites on the Shivwitz Plateau. Um, yeah. So, and then Heather asks, when you're speaking. Okay, so Heather's asking about intellectual property issues. So in regards to sharing rituals the issue with that is it is more of how can we be respectful to the cultural groups so i'm right now working with the hopi um and in working with the hopi i had to explain to them how they are in charge and that because i mean every native american loves to hear the white man say i'm here to help so it's kind of trying to dance around that while saying like well tell well not telling them but you know, trying to present, you know, like, hey, you guys are trying to have people understand, you know, your cultural identity. I have a way to help you with that. And then I explained to them how it's like, you know, you're, you guys hold the rights to everything. This is, this is your, these are your traditions. This is your culture that you're putting out to the world with VR. It's up to you how you want to do that. I'm here to kind of provide the, the means to, to help with that. And anything we, you know, any money we make on it goes directly back to the Hopi. And if I'm getting paid, it would be paid through like, you know, through from the grant and then any residual costs go back to them and they retain the, 
the intellectual rights to it. And so, yeah, there are protections in place and it's usually, you know, those cultural groups that are saying, hey, if you want to work with us, you have to meet these standards that we've set for you to work with us. But then if you bypass all of that and don't work with them, they can probably come after you legally. All right. So what is the name of the website he was showing the balls from? So the name of that website is it's called Sketchfab. I'll put it in the chat. I just put it in the chat. Oh, there you go. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So, and then was there any? Miss Did you else? see the question about scanning um, things larger than artifacts? Have you done any scanning of sites? Yeah, I have. Um, let me give you this. Put this in the chat. This is my own personal Sketchfab, and um, I've worked. So I've worked with Dr. Roth and Mogion, Dr. Hari, uh, both professors from UNLV. Uh, I've worked with Dr. Hari; she's my advisor with um, sites on the Shivitz Plateau, and then I've recently worked with uh, Tule Springs in digitizing some mammoth remains or mammoth sites. Uh, just in Northwest Las Vegas. But if you look at the link I sent, you can see a lot of those sites that have been digitized. And I've also digitized animal remains and human remains and ceramics and some rock art too. Actually digitized some rock art on the Shivitz Plateau, which is you know more on the south, more towards the southern tip of the Shivitz Plateau. That was actually a really cool find. So, yeah. Any other questions? I'm not seeing any pop up, but I do have a couple of questions. Maybe. Sure. Um, so I do a lot of my work through grants. Um, that's how I fund myself. I mm -hmm. don't have a real job. I'm a contractor. So, <laughs> so um, I was wondering cost wise, um, you know, if you were to scan a site and I mean, you're in school now, you, the projects you've been doing are for professors. Um, mm. Do you, I mean, the sounds to somebody on the outside, this would be really darn expensive. It is. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. If you could talk a little bit about the expense. Yeah. So, there, there's a lot of work that goes into this, like a ton of work. Um, you know, you got to, I mean, it, it depends on like how many things you're scanning, how complex the object is that you're scanning. Um, if you're doing VR, you know, how many actors do you have? Are you, do you need to pay them? I mean, you should pay them. Um, you know, there's the costs and just, you know, so like if we're doing a, a, a VR film like Carne Arena, that's that's in the millions of dollars because um, you got all that equipment. You've got all those all the people that are working on the project. You've got the people, the, the graphic artists, you know, and there's um, there's a lot of costs with unions. So it, it all adds up. That's where the grants come in. Because when I'm look, because that that's the part that makes it hard for, you know, museums. When you have something like the the Smithsonian or the uh, the Holocaust Museum in Chicago, there's a lot of funding there, and they're able to bring in these amazing projects that are just so beneficial for everyone. But what about Lost City Museum? It's my all time favorite museum. They don't have a lot of money. So how do we bring them something that's pretty much at the level of the Holocaust Museum or Carnier Arena, but they're just a little, they're a small museum in Overton, Nevada with, with a tight budget. And that's where the grants come in. And if you can bring it in with a lot of umph, hopefully you can get that funding. If you don't get the funding, you know, there's ways you can try to do things like, 
the 47 models, I wasn't paid for that. The undergrads weren't paid for that. That was all our own dime. And yet it's been a huge benefit in showing kids these 3D models uh, with school, especially now during the pandemic. When the when Clark County School District first transitioned to the distant learning, teachers had a resource that you could go to be like, hey, I found this really cool website. Use this, you know, for you know, maybe check this out to help you in teaching your online videos, you know, your online classes. So Wendy posted the the Sketchfab account for Lost City Museum to the teachers, and she got a huge response from teachers like, this is incredible. This is, oh, this is going to be huge help for us. And it has been. And seeing, and again, it just comes down back to seeing the kids' responses tells me that this, this works. Because they I get so enthusiastic, they get so excited about it, and they're like, I, I want to know more about this. And I just I love hearing those reactions and it makes and it gives me drive to make things more crazy, you know. So I mean I've got crazy ideas. You probably don't want to hear about them, but yeah, it but it does come back to cost. And that's where we look at like the uh, National Endowment for Humanities, you know, maybe some private organization, funding organizations. Um, but one thing I've been learning, and I'm sure, you know, just as well, Raya, is you, you got to have that umph in, in the grant or people will be like, oh, whatever, you know, they'll pass it on, they'll pass by it. So got to use those cool buzzwords. Yeah, they're super important. Um, I've been doing some videos um, <laughs> with a GoPro and some video editing software. And we've been trying to elevate the kind of information that we give people, um, including the nonprofit. Instead of having, you know, a physical thing, teachers have to go and like check out. We put it on Teachers Pay Teachers and then we put it up for free. And then they can download it and utilize the resources. Um, and having videos that go along with that. And, you know, we're That's just awesome. now taping, yeah, taking those first steps into it. And um, we've been, you know, trying to use video and stuff more now for training because same issue that the schools are having. Um, so I think this is all very, very relevant um, to some of us. It can seem, you know, oh my gosh, you know, you have to have all that technology and, and skill. Um, but I think even the everyday person that's out there, you got a smartphone, you know, take some video, share, share things as best you can. Um, I think it would be really exciting if, if we had a tribal uh, representation and did some, you know, storytelling with the, the videos of some of the local sites and, and bring in that voice and experience. Um, I think that would be very impactful. Um, 100%, 100%. And I mean, with that too, is this is one thing that has really been jumping out to me in doing this kind of uh, these projects and research is just how much people love hearing about the past, not just like, oh, this is an event that occurred, but hearing the, the challenges that had to be overcome in those stories and with that is i find a huge love and desire of family history where you know we talk about you know doing these sites and bringing in tribal representation which i'm a thousand percent on top of you know i i totally agree with that you know that's the direction i'm hoping to be going i i am going i hope i am going but as cultural preservationists, you know, we can also start at home by interviewing, you know, our, our relatives, our friends and hearing their stories that they have to share and just, you know, kind of collecting those together to just kind of create a, a, a data point where, or not data point, but, you know, a compilation of stories about, you know, just our, the immediate subculture that we're in you know our community and that's something that future generations will love i mean one of my goals in doing this project is the ability to interview grandparents um my my father he passed away in 2000 
2017, 2018. And my, one of my biggest regrets is I wasn't able to do a virtual reality interview with him. And so I immediately went to my grandpa and I'm like, you're telling me your war stories. You're telling me your life stories. So I set up my three D, my VR camera. We went to a World War II Memorial Museum in Palm Springs, and he he gave make sure I'm not muted. <laughs> he gave me an interview, you know, talking about like, oh yeah, this is the airplane I flew. You know, I I ran into problems with this engine. Um, not that that was the actual airplane, but it was the same type of airplane, and I, I got it all on video. And so now I have that video future gen and you can wear a vr headset and it's like you're staying next to my grandpa as he's telling you these stories it's incredible my cousins love it my aunts and uncles love it and it's just this experience where what if instead of reading your grandpa's journal you know which is still amazing what if you could sit across from them 200 years from now you know you're sitting you know you Imagine being able to sit across from your great, great, great grandparent and them telling you their life story and then, but, you know, telling you the challenges they overcame. And at the very end, they look right at you and tell you they love you. This is what we can achieve with virtual reality and doing those kind of interviews with our immediate family and extended family. And that's something I want to also help facilitate for people. You know, once I get my PhD, you know, and I can start doing my business, <laughs> But that's the goal here is to be cultural preservationists and anthropologists. We don't just skip our own family and friends. We include them in it because how can we be preserving this stuff and recording this stuff if we're not doing it immediately at home? Um, and regardless of the good and the bad, it's those stories we need because when we know those stories that been shared for thousands millions of years you know that's what has helped people move forward and to be able to stay you know maintain solidarity and learn what we can from our own mistakes and from other people's mistakes and to try to improve ourselves and that's that's the end goal here is to help us see others as ourselves and that they laugh and cry just as we do bit of soapbox there i apologize <laughs> yeah you're gonna make us cry i'm just tearing up over here <laughs> um but no thank you again very much for joining us on this friday the 13th <laughs> to, <laughs> to talk about all of this um you know where we're going in the future and and um how that relates to us and what we're doing today so again i want to thank you uh, thank for you. the wonderful presentation. And I think I'm gonna, it doesn't look like there's any more comments or questions. I'm gonna go ahead and, and end this okay. uh, evening's presentation. And if everybody- Thank could, you, everyone. <laughs> Appreciate your everybody attendance. everybody could, we gotta thanks a bunch and I'll clap because everybody else is <laughs> <Thank> silenced. <you. laughs> and um, we got some more thank yous. But there is that quick survey at the end. Um, just be honest, let us know how it's going. And we look forward to seeing you guys in the future. Thank you again. All right, thanks, Ben.